things. Hallelujah. This is a day of victory. Hallelujah. This is a day of victory. Hallelujah. This is a day of deliverance. Hallelujah. Glory be to God because the Lord our God commands victories and deliverances concerning us. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Amen. We welcome you to another, amen, Bible study night. Amen. It is Tuesday night and it is Bible study night here at the Prayer, Faith, and Encouragement Ministries International. Amen. We are going to start off our Bible studies night by declaring in praise and in song. Amen. Brother John is going to help me with the drums. Amen. And we are going to just be singing unto the Lord. Amen. A chorus from um, the Caribbean, a chorus from back home all my help comes from the Lord and we're just going to declare that in song amen and then we're going to move into a study for tonight those of you who have joined us live we say welcome 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 those who are viewing this recording at a later time you are also bidden welcome amen amen share the link with someone let someone know that teaching time is here it's time to study to show ourselves approved unto God get your tools together and let's get amen at the feet of the spirit of the living God that he may be able to teach us all my help comes from the Lord all right all my help comes from the Lord Oh, 
his children, does he not? A good father, amen, does not allow his children to be taken advantage of. When he knows they have needs, even before they ask him, he provides, amen. He is our daddy -o. And all of our help comes from the Lord God. Amen. Hallelujah. We thank you for joining us on tonight. Amen. Without any further ado, we're going to turn our Bibles. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Yes, we are going to turn our Bibles to Psalms 18. Amen. Psalms chapter 18. Psalms chapter 18. Verses 31 through 34. Psalms chapter 18, verses 31 through 34. Amen. I give honor, amen, to the spirit of the living God who is here among us. Glory be to God. While you turn there, I give honor to the um, founding apostle of this house, of this ministry, Chief Apostle Christine Chittick. I give honor to my husband, Pastor Thad, to ministers, Mays in our midst, to the congregation and all those of you, amen, who have joined us. Those of you pastors and ministers and apostles who stop by every now and then, amen, and partake of the, the, the food that God prepares for us here. I give honor to you. I bless God for you. And I trust that tonight, amen, you will continue to be fed by the Spirit of God, amen, and be equipped Hallelujah, to be victorious in all that God has granted and has given to us. Amen. Psalms 18, we are going to read a few verses. We are going to read about five verses, starting from verse 31 through 34. And then we are going to jump to verse 39. 31 through 34, and then 39. Amen. And it reads thus, and I'm reading from the King James Version. For who is God save the Lord? Or who is a rock save our God? It is God that girdeth me with strength and maketh my way perfect. He maketh my feet like hinds feet and setteth me upon my high places. He teaches my hands to war so that a bow of steel is broken by mine hands. Mine arm, sorry. Verse 39. For thou hast girded me with strength unto the battle. Thou hast subdued under me those that rise up against me. Thou hast girded me with strength unto the battle. Thou hast subdued under me those that rise up against me. Amen. Bless God. We are going to be looking at that at our conclusion on tonight, but we are just going to set that into the atmosphere to declare that God has indeed equipped uh, equip us for warfare. Tonight we are concluding our teachings, amen, for the past eight Tuesday nights. We have been teaching on intelligence in warfare. We've looked at adversaries in the war. We've looked at weapons of the warfare. And tonight we are going to conclude with strategies for warfare. Strategies for warfare. Amen? But before we go into our strategies on tonight, I want to just kind of set a context for us. Set a context for us. Now, from the time we were conceived, we entered a war. We entered the war. How many of us know that? Um, we did not have a choice as to the family we were going to be born into. We didn't have a choice as to the geographical location we were going to be born into. We didn't even have a choice as to what our makeup would have been, what our design would have been. And similarly, we did not have a choice. No human being has a choice or had a choice about entering in the war. From the time you were conceived in your mother's womb, amen, you entered the war. Uh -huh. From the time you were conceived in your mother's womb, you were transported from the spiritual realm, uh -huh, where we were known by God, according to Jeremiah. We were ordained by God before we were in our mother's womb. But from the time we got into our mother's womb, we were transported, amen, from the spiritual realm, using our mother's womb as a portal, a gateway from the spirit into the natural, into the physical, we entered the war, every human being. This has nothing to do with whether you are a born-again believer or whether you are a sinner. Every human being is part of the war. We did not have a choice on whose side we would be when we got here. 
for some of us, like those of us who were born into a Christian family, like John and Grace, let's use you as an example, you happen to be put on the side of the wall that was the kingdom of light because you were born through the womb of spiritual parents, of, 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 of saved or born again believers. So you didn't have a choice. When you came in, you ended up on the side with the kingdom of light until you grew to a place where you're able to understand and make a choice for yourself as to which side of the warfare do I want to be on? Do I want to be a part of the kingdom of light fighters or do I want to be a part of the kingdom of darkness fighters? So all of us, when we were born, we were thrown into this war. Mm -hmm. As we grew and became knowledgeable of good and evil, right and wrong, we made choices as to which sides of the war we would be on. Okay, I'm setting a context to conclude tonight on strategies of the warfare. For those of us who chose the light, for those of us who chose to join the fight with those of the kingdom of light, it seems as if the warfare rages thicker and hotter against us, does it not? The reason for that is because we are living in and we are fighting in a world that is ruled by the prince of darkness. The Bible tells us that Satan is the prince of this world. So the kingdom of light folks, the kingdom of light warriors, we tend to have what it seems like, and notice I'm using the word seems like, a more difficult time in the warfare. It would seem as if those that belong to the kingdom of darkness are just skipping through and sailing through. And there's no, nothing, they're having no fight, they're having no problem, but trust me, they are in the war. It is seeming more difficult for us because we are going against the current. We are going against the vein. Amen. We are marching to a different rhythm than the rest of the world is. So it seems to us as if it's more difficult, the warfare that we're in. It seems as if the fight is hotter and the fight is greater. Because it seems as if we are fighting and we are in hostile territory. We are fighting in the the territory or the domain of the prince of darkness, the kingdom of darkness. We are on his camp. We are on his land. We are on his battlefield, it would seem like. And so it seems more difficult for us. Would you agree? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. you, you look at someone your age, the same age, the same race, the same economical background, and it seems as if you have a greater struggle because you're serving Christ than they do. It is not that there is a greater struggle. It's because we are fighting in hostile territory. So if we are going to fight and win. To have intelligence and fight intelligently. If we are going to be victorious as we fight and engage in warfare in hostile territory. We have to have an advantage over our adversaries. What's that advantage? We need to have intelligence and we need to fight intelligently. No, that have been discussing all this time. Amen. Glory be to God these past eight weeks. What is the intelligence? Hallelujah. So we've been, it's okay, John, um, that is helping me. We have been discussing how we can gather intelligence. And we've been discussing what some of this intelligence is and how we can use this effectively, how we can fight intelligently. Our yeah is so that the kingdom of God will come here on the earth and his will will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. I'm going to say that again. Our warfare, the goal of our warfare, the goal of our warfare is that the kingdom of God will come here on earth and his will will be done here on earth as it is done in heaven. Why? Psalms 115, I think it's verse 16. I might be wrong. Verse 12, somewhere there. It says that the, to the children was given earth. 
Uh -huh. Earth was given to the children of men. Earth belongs to the children of men. And we know that Satan got earth or the kingdom of earth through illegal means. What did he use? He used deception. He used fraudulent means to what? To get the kingdom of earth from men and make it his. And so what the kingdom of light fighters are doing, God has sent us here to earth, just like he sent John, just like he sent Jesus Christ. He sent us here on earth to become part of the fight so that we can do what? We can ensure, like Jesus has taught us to pray, that his kingdom comes to earth and his will be done on earth even as it is done in heaven. It is the same thing he wanted of Adam. He wanted what? His kingdom, his reign, his rulership, his dominion, God's, to be on earth uh, just like it was in heaven. So what did he do? He created a being. He created a species in his image and in his likeness. He called that species man or human, and he gave them the kingdom of earth so that what? The kingdom of earth could replicate, could resemble, could mirror the kingdom of God. And the will of God could be done on earth as it was done in heaven. So all this thing that we're talking about warfare, all this fight that we're talking about, the goal of the warfare for the kingdom of light fighters is for the kingdom of God to come on earth. And by the kingdom of God, we're talking about what? His rule, his reign, and his dominion to be on earth just as it is in heaven. Guess what? The kingdom of darkness fighters are fighting for the same goal. Their goal is that Satan's kingdom will remain here on earth and his will would be done on earth just like God's will is done in heaven. So we both have the same goal. What's the same goal we have? All of the fighters, all of the warriors, is that our master's dominion will be here. Our master's rule will be here. Our master's reign will be here. So there's a fight for whose kingdom will succeed on earth. Whose dominion will be over earth. Whose will will be done in earth. So when we're talking about becoming intelligent in warfare, when we're talking about our weapons and our strategies, we are talking about achieving the goal for God's rule, God's reign, God's dominion and kingdom to be in our lives. And if enough of us, that's why I mean as this, we need to make disciples, because as we multiply, because this kingdom of, the kingdom of God is found where? In me. So as we make more of us, then there's more of what? His kingdom reigning here on earth. There is more expression of his what? Will on earth. Similarly, Satan, the more he can keep us in bondage, is the more that his kingdom is established on earth and his will is done in the earth. So I want us to think about that because we're going to be going back to that throughout the night as we talk about our strategies for warfare, okay? So we're going to be thinking more about that. So Pastor Thab, if you will go ahead and just... Um, go to that second slide for me so that we can just reiterate that into our viewers' mindset. The goal of our warfare is what? That God's kingdom would come and God's will be done. So every battle I'm in, the battle isn't really about me. <laughs> the battle isn't about what I want. The battle is about me as far as I can express God's will on earth. And I can ensure that his kingdom is established in me so that it can be established in the spheres of my influence here on earth. What are the spheres of my influence? My home, my community, my workplace, the church where I worship, my country, my nation. These are the spheres of my influence. And wherever I move within these spheres, I should be taking the kingdom of God with me so that his will can be expressed throughout me. All right, are we good with that? All right, I can put this away and make some space here for me. All right, let's get going. So that was the context for our, um, our conclusion for tonight's teaching. What did I say intelligence in warfare was? Intelligence in warfare, let's just review that definition. It's what? The acquisition of knowledge or information, huh? the acquisition or the acquiring, the obtaining, the getting, if, if, you know, if you don't want to work with acquisition, getting knowledge, getting information, and effectively using it mm -hmm, in this conflict.
to getting knowledge and effectively using it in this conflict. So when I am fighting intelligently, it means that I'm using knowledge. Whose knowledge? My knowledge? Mm -mm. Knowledge from the word of God. Knowledge from the Holy Spirit. I'm using God's knowledge to fight effectively. That's what intelligent warfare is. Using God's knowledge to fight effectively. All right, so let's go on. Examples of battles or conflicts or warfare, and these words we're going to use interchangeably. So the war has been going on before we got here, right? The war has been going on between Satan and God a very long time. Huh? But we are engaged in battles. Battles are like small little mini conflicts within the war. All right? So we are engaged in, in battles. And examples of some of the battles or conflicts or warfare, and I'm going to use those three words interchangeably all night. Examples of battles, conflicts, and warfare would include things like battles against diseases. Would you agree? That's a warfare. Battle with our emotions. How many of you that's a huge warfare? Mm -hmm. Battles to overcome challenges, to overcome adversities, to overcome disadvantages. All of these are ways in which the battle or the warfare might manifest itself. Battles even to achieve things, to achieve success, to achieve advancement, to achieve betterment. All of these things are not going to come easy. They're not just going to come like that to us kingdom fighters. Why? Because we're in a hostile environment, and if we achieve these things, it means that we are on our way to cause God, God's kingdom to come and to cause his will to be done. So we are going to be going through tonight. Tonight is about looking at some strategies that we can use for specific warfares or battles. I can't do all of the battles tonight, but I'm going to do four major battles that I think all of us at some point in our lives will experience. Okay, so we're going to cover four main, one, main ones on tonight. All right, wherever warfare is required, there is need for intelligence. I need to acquire knowledge about what? What are the things that I need to acquire knowledge about? My adversaries, myself, <laughs> the weapons that are available to me, and how I can use all of these to plan an attack. What knowledge do I use? The knowledge of my adversaries. Who remember what the adversaries were? John. Satan, 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 my flesh, and the world. Those are my three main adversaries. Sin works in my flesh, but the adversary is actually my flesh, all right? So Satan, the world, and the flesh, and we did those in lessons two, three, and four, all right? So you can go back and check those out. The, I must use the knowledge of my adversaries. I must also use the knowledge of what? Myself and the weapons that are available to me, and all three of these things together will inform what my attack should look like, or what my warfare should look like, what my response or my fight should look like. Myself, my adversaries, and the weapons that are available to me. So, for every battle that I face, slide number four, Pastor Thad, for every battle that I face, every conflict that I encounter, I, there are four main questions that I need to ask myself. Who is my adversary in this conflict? That's question number one. So, you tell me, Pastor Alex, you don't understand. Pray for me because I'm on the warfare. Okay, all right. So, who exactly it is? Who, who is your adversary? Who is the main adversary that's fighting you? Is it the world that you're in warfare against? Is it your flesh that you're fighting with or struggling with, battling with? Or is it Satan? And when I say Satan, I'm, he is going to kind of be the umbrella for demons, devils, evil spirits, principalities, evil spirits. Whenever I say Satan, think of evil spirits as well, okay? So when someone says to you, you say to me, Pastor Alex, pray for me. This week I've been on the warfare. I've been on the heavy warfare. My next question to you should be, who, it, who is the adversary you're fighting? Because the adversary that you're fighting will determine the weapons that you need and it will determine what you need to ask yourself about yourself. All right? So who is my adversary in this conflict? The second question is, what do I know about me? Now, question two has two parts. What do I know about me that can aid or help the adversary to win? What do I know about me that can Give the, I'm just repeating a, 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 a different way, okay? So it's, what is it about me that can aid the adversary, can help him to win against me? 
What is it about me that can give the adversary an advantage over me? And I'm thinking about things like my weaknesses, my appetites, my past defeats, my propensities and inclinations. What are those? Those are big words. What are the things that I easily lean to? Mm -hmm. What are the things that we don't even think in? That's my nature. That's, that's part of my personality. But they present an advantage to the enemy. Okay? So before I just go and say, okay, I'm going and, oh, oh you punch me, I'm going to punch you back. I need to ask myself, what can the enemy find in me that he can use against me that he can help to bring about my defeat? The second part of that question is, what do I know about me that I can use against the enemy? So not only what can, is the, because we're not made up of only weaknesses. We're made up of strengths as well. All right? So what are some of my strengths? What are some of my propensities? Because not all of your propensities and inclinations are bad. Mm -hmm. The things that you lean to aren't all bad. There are some things that you lean to that are good and they can actually help you to win the warfare. So what are my strengths? In this particular conflict, what are my strengths? What are my, weak, my, my, my propensities, my appetites? What are my past victories and what did I do that caused me to win? Mm -hmm. So when there is a warfare that, that's raging, we don't sit in the corner and suck our thumbs and cry. That's when we pull out intelligence. We stop, and I know one sister's minister, um, Jasmine, like that, I'm, anal I'm analytical, right? so this should be up her alley. You stop and you analyze the battle. Mm -hmm. You stop, and in the midst of the crying, okay, while you're crying, analyze. Uh -huh. While you're wiping your nose, analyze. But evaluate the battle. Ask yourself some questions. So question one, who is the adversary that I'm fighting in this conflict? What, no, question two, A, what is there about me that can help the adversary to defeat me? Question 2B, what is there about me that I can use to help defeat that adversary? All right. Number three, what, which of the weapons that I know or I have at my disposal is best suited for this conflict? Which weapon is best suited for this conflict? Remember last week we learned that for most of the weapons, they can be used for Almost all of the, 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 the conflicts or warfares or battles. But there are some weapons that are specifically more effective in some conflicts than others. Uh -huh. So which weapon is best suited for this battle that I'm in right now? This warfare that I'm engaged in? And the last question, question number four is, based on all of this that I've looked at, the adversary, my strengths, my weaknesses, the weapons that I have at my disposal that are best suited, because some of us have weapons, but we're not skillful in them. For example, if you're not someone who practices to pray, <laughs> and this calls for an intercessory travailing warfare type of prayer, though that might be the best weapon for that conflict, it will not be the best weapon for you, because you are not skillful in its use. Remember David and Saul? When David was going to meet Goliath, Saul, in his experience, and his knowledge, knew that David needed defensive armor. And so he gave David his suit to wear. Remember the story? David said, mm, I can't wear this. It might work for you, but it won't work for me because I haven't tried this out. I'm not used to this. This is going to become a handicap for me. And so even though a weapon might be best suited for the conflict, it may not be best suited for you. It might become a handicap because you're not versed and skillful in the use of the weapon. That's why it's important as believers, as kingdom fighters, that we become as skillful as we can in as many weapons as necessary because we need to be sure to have the best weapon that suits the conflict. Does that make sense? All right. Now, it sounds academic, but we're going to get into some scriptures in a minute. So, did we get our four questions? I'm going to put all of this together. Question number five. Number four, yes. And I'm going to say, what then must be my tactical position? Number four, that's it. What then must be my tactical position? So what then must be my tactical position? So remember, in lesson one, we learned that your strategy is your plan, your long-term plan for the goal you want to achieve. But your tactical position speaks about those deliberate, specific actions you're going to take right now 
in this battle that you're facing. So we also learned there were two main tactical positions. Who remember what the two main tactical positions were? <laughs> offensive or defensive? Am I going to go on the offensive after I've evaluated this? Or am I going to go on the defensive? Based on the intelligence I have, based on my strengths, my weaknesses, the adversary, the weapons that I have available and can use, what would give me victory at this point? What's the offensive? Who remembers what, the, what is my attitude or my position when I go on the offensive? Aggression and attack. When I go on the defensive, my attitude is resist so as to secure what I already have. So when I look at all of this, am I going to go full force and am I going to attack aggressively? Do I have what it takes to attack the adversary and win? If the answer is, or am I best positioned right now to just resist and secure what I already have? Mm-hmm. All right. So these are the questions for every warfare as we go away. That's what's going to determine what strategy I'm going to choose. All these four together. We're doing four of them tonight. Okay? Ready? Battle number one. Poverty. Now, Pastor Thad, like I said, sometime later this year, is going to be doing a conference called Money is a Defense. And so he's going to go into this in more depth, but I know that this is one that all of us fight with. A, a lot of people right now are fighting financial lack. Okay? Poverty. Battle number one, poverty. So tonight we'll be looking at four battles, and we're going to be asking ourselves, um, what strategies of warfare does the Bible give us to win in this battle against poverty. Okay? All right, ready? Let's turn our Bibles to Ecclesiastes chapter 9 and verses 13 to 18. Then, um, this passage is for, for you. Should I give you two at a time or one? That's fine. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, 13 to 18. Proverbs 10, 15 will follow. And I'm reading from the King James Version. Now there was found in it, and in it there is a city. There was a city. Let me, I'm reading from my, reading from the King James. Okay, here we go, from verse 13. There was a little city, sorry, Ecclesiastes chapter 9, I'm sorry, from verse 14. I'm sorry, from verse 14. Forgive me, forgive me. There was a little city and few men within it. And there came a great king against it and besieged it and built great bulwarks against it. Now there was found in it a poor wise man. What were the descriptions that they gave us about this man? Poor. He was poor, but he was wise. All right. What is there about me <laughs> uh -huh. that can aid the adversary? And what is there about me that I can use against the adversary? This man was both poor and wise. And he, by his wisdom, delivered the city. Yet no man remembered that same poor man. Then said I, wisdom is better than strength. Nevertheless, the poor man's wisdom is despised and his words are not heard. Why isn't his words, why aren't his words heard? Because he's poor. He had something that could win him a battle. Which battle did he win? In this scripture, which battle did he win? He won the battle for the city for, against that king that was coming up. Remember last week we talked about the wise woman who won the battle, but wise old woman who won the battle against Joab. So he used his wisdom to somehow get the city out of that. That's right. He used strategy to get the city. Though the city was what? Small. It was little. A few people were in it. A great king had come against him. So it looks as if the city was already slaughtered, right? This city didn't look like it had any hope. They were done for. But this man had something that he could use against the enemy. What did he have? Wisdom. So his wisdom won the battle for the city. Let's go back to what our, our strategy, our main goal in the fight is what? What's the main goal in the fight? That the kingdom, the rulership, 
the dominion of our master will be here and his will will be done. He had something though that the adversary could use against him that would stop the kingdom, the influence, the rulership, the dominion of his master to be there. He was poor. And because he was poor, he was forgotten. Even though he had wisdom, even though the city only had a few people, so they had to remember the memory, they couldn't have had amnesia. But he had no influence. He had no influence. We're talking about the battle against poverty. Poverty is one of the most dangerous weapons or battles that the kingdom of light warriors face. Because when we are poor, we don't have a voice. When we are poor, we are not heard. Our words are not heard. No matter how wise we are, no matter how holy and righteous we are, our words are not heard so we cannot affect the world. We cannot affect the world by causing the kingdom of God, his rulership, his dominion, his influence, remember that all of that has to do with the kingdom, to be affected here on earth because we are poor. Let's look at another scripture. Proverbs 10 and 15. It says, Proverbs 10 and 15. The rich man's wealth is his strong city. Proverbs 4, 10 and 15. The rich man's wealth is his strong city. The destruction of the poor is their poverty. Poverty destroys. No matter how much Holy Ghost you have, if you're poor, you're on a path to destruction. Mm -hmm. If you're poor, you cannot affect change on earth. And the reason God sent us here was to do what? To affect change. Jesus said, pray, thy kingdom come. That's affecting change. Thy will be done. That's affecting change on earth. And if that, um, and this, is at the, this is at the prosperity gospel where I'm saying get house, get land, get car. That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about getting rid of poverty so we can have the influence that is needed to affect change here on earth. So that when we say thy kingdom come, it can come and be heard. Uh-huh. All right. So let's run on. Poverty is a battle that can either be inherited or acquired. All of our conflicts and our warfares or battles, they can be either inherited. What does that mean? Pass on from one generation to another or they can be acquired. Unfortunately for the black race, here in the United States of America and in the Caribbean, because we are coming from the past, what, 400 years of history as slaves, the majority of us, we have been passed on a legacy of poverty. Am I lying? Mm -hmm. So when we come out of our mother's womb, we already come out with a disadvantage. We are born into the world, no matter how intelligent we are. There are some of us, and I'm, I'm this, I'm, this is a hazard we've been, we've been pro black. I'm sure there are other cultures who can say the same thing, but I'm black and I'm talking about what I know about. Okay? There are some of our students who are more intelligent than others, but because they are poor, they fall out of, out of school. They don't have bread to go to school. Huh? Some of them live in countries where if you don't have money, you, you cannot be sent to school. There are some, some Caribbean islands where you still have to pay school fee to go to school, and they are intelligent, no matter how intelligent they are, they fall through the cracks because of poverty. So God sent them to earth, he did, with a brain that can affect change. But the assignment is already disadvantaged because of the spirit of poverty. But tonight we are coming up against poverty in the name of Jesus. We are going to learn the strategies according to the word of God. We're going to put them into practice. Hallelujah. And we're going to rise out of poverty. Because God is not a God that leaves us in a place of disadvantage. He says that if you would observe to do all that I've told you to do in Joshua 1 and verse 8. If you don't allow this book to depart out of your mouth. If you meditate in it day and night. If you don't turn to the left or to the right. But you observe to do all you will make your way prosperous and you will have good success he has given us a way to combat the poverty that we acquired or we inherited we have no excuse 
He gave us intelligence. That's what he said, this book. If you allow this book not to depart out of your mouth, you can fight against poverty and win. You might not have been born the child or the daughter or the son of Bill Gates, but you can still win. Because what? There's a strategy in here. All right? So poverty can be inherited. And there's some people, they, they, there's a curse of poverty on them. It's not just they were born poor. But it's as if generations and generations, every time somebody looks like they're going to break free from the poverty, something comes up and everybody is, is, in, is, is just in terrible poverty. For some people, it's a curse. And yes, it's a cycle that goes from one. Nobody in the family ever breaks out of it. It's just like a cycle that goes on. But tonight, in the name of Jesus, we are going to get God's intelligence so we can break free of it. Poverty is a battle that is associated with needs. When you think poverty, you think needs. Uh huh. Things that are required for your survival and your thriving within the territory that God has placed you. I'm going to say that again. It's associated with your needs to survive and thrive in the territory. Because remember, he sent us to earth to do what? To affect change. So that his kingdom can come and his will can be done wherever he placed us. So we were born in Antigua. Mm -hmm. And so the spirit of poverty comes against me. So I will not have what I need to survive in Antigua. So I won't have what I need to thrive in Antigua. So that my voice cannot be heard in Antigua. Are you following where I'm going with this? He moves us to America. And guess what? The spirit of poverty will say, okay, all right, I'm going to do the same. You're in Monk's Corner, South Carolina. I come up against you so you can't, your needs can't be met. So you can't survive in Monk's Corner. You can't thrive in Monk's Corner. And therefore your voice will not be heard in Monk's. That's what poverty comes for. It comes to shut you down. Keep you poor so your voice will not be heard. Mm -hmm. Poverty is lacking. That's the definition of poverty. Lacking or not having enough. It's what? Lacking or not having enough resources to meet the needs. It's what? Lacking or not having enough resources to meet the need. So guess what? You're constantly, you're, you're going to be constantly distracted from the work of God because you're constantly trying to stay alive. All you're doing is working to eat a bread. So you have no time to focus on thy kingdom come, thy will be done. <laughs> because right now, I just need to eat. I need a roof over my head. I need to have, make sure my transport is intact. I need to make sure that my, my medical bills, you see I'm going with this? So poverty comes to keep us at a place where we cannot affect change because we are so busy trying, mm, we are busy trying to do what? Meet our needs. And there's nothing wrong with meeting your needs. You're supposed to meet your needs. If you don't meet your needs, you're going to die. <laughs> if you don't have any life, you can't affect change. All right? Poverty is relative. Everybody say poverty is relative. Poverty is relative. It's relative to my assignment and it's relative to my environment. That's why I'm not teaching a prosperity message. There are some people's assignment that, that what I would consider a need, for what they would consider a need is not a need for me. So for example, um, let me use, okay, let me use a jet, for example. A jet. If I'm called to travel all over the globe, and I'm called to take teams with me all over the globe. You're not called to travel all over the globe. You're called to stay right here in Monk's Corner. You work in Monk's Corner. Your church is in Monk's Corner. Your school is in Monk's Corner. You shop in Monk's Corner. For who would a jet be a need? The person whose assignment is Monk's Corner? Or the person whose assignment is to constantly be traveling with teams around the globe? I'm just making a, it's a very far-fetched um, example. But, but you, you understand what I mean? About your, 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 your poverty is relative to what? Your assignment and your environment. Because remember, I am sent to affect change. So if my assignment is one that is global, my needs must match that. You follow where I'm going? So this is where I'm not teaching prosperity message. If you don't have a jet, you're not prosperous. The devil is a lie. I don't need a jet. <laughs> Why do I need a jet? You see what I'm saying? 
but then I'm not going to bash somebody else who has one. Because if their assignment is for that, then to God be the glory. So poverty is relative. It's relative to your environment. It's relative to your assignments. I just gave an example of your assignment. Now, the environment, the cost of living determines whether or not you're poor. So it is said that one of the, the poorest people in America are richer than some of the people across the globe. You've heard that saying, right? So there are people in America who are suffering poverty. They're below the, 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 the threshold. So the, the government considers them poor. So they get certain services. But if you take what they have and you compare it with people across the globe, they would look rich. But they're not rich in America. In their environment, they're not meeting their needs for their environment. And why am I talking about this? Because everybody's fight is unique. Everybody's fight is personal. Uh-huh. So when I'm fighting the strategy for my warfare, I cannot look to you to advise me as to the strategy. Because we both might be suffering from poverty or fighting poverty, but my assignment and my environment is different than yours. So my strategy for warfare, my tactical position that I will take may differ from yours. Uh, does this make sense? Uh huh. So when we're thinking about this strategy for poverty here, fighting poverty, we need to think about it in terms of relative terms. What are my needs based on my environment and based on my assignment? That's how I can determine, okay, if it's, this is poverty, then this is what I'm fighting against. Poverty can be economical, which happens to do with finances, it can be spiritual, because how many of you know that there are many people right now whose spiritual needs are not being met? That which they need spiritually to survive and thrive in their territory, they do not have access to it, or they don't know how to get it. Am I, am I, am I telling the truth? So when we're talking about private poverty tonight, I'm not just talking about money and material possessions and material needs, when we're talking about warring against the spirit of poverty or the assignment of poverty, the warfare of poverty, you need to ask yourself, am I right now going through a spiritual poverty or an economical poverty or both? Uh -huh. And then I'm going to ask those questions to inform my warfare. Poverty is an attack because it keeps us in a place and position of servitude in this world. I'm going to say that again. Poverty is an attack because its assignment is to do what? Keep us in a place and position of servitude. We will forever be slaves to this world when we are poor. And the world system. Satan isn't the adversary when it comes to poverty. Who knows what the adversary is when it comes to poverty or main adversary? The world system. The world system. The world system. Pastor Tad, give us Proverbs 22 and verse 7. Proverbs 22 and verse 7. Proverbs 22 and verse 7. This is what it says. The rich ruleth over the poor. And the borrower is servant to the lender. The rich ruleth over the poor. What word, what word in that statement, the rich ruleth over the poor, is a word that has to do with our goal. What was the word? Ruleth. Uh-huh. Our goal is what? To have God's dominion and rulership here. So if we are not the rich ones, <laughs> it's God's dominion. It's God's dominion. Uh-huh. Proverbs 20, 27. If we are not among the rich, are we in a position for God's rulership to be on this earth? So I, I am not seeking to get rich so I can compete with people. That's what we don't see. As Christians, we don't seek to get rich. Uh-uh. We, 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 we try, we, we are fighting against the spirit of poverty so that we can be rightly positioned. So we can be rightly positioned for the rulership and the reign of God to be seen and work through us. Does that make sense? Yes? All right. So... So I don't seek to be rich because I want things. I seek to be rich, or I seek rather not to be rich. I seek to fight against poverty, to eradicate poverty out of my life so I can be rightly positioned for God's dominion to be in me so that it can be um, dispensed in the earth. Yes, no, but the Bible tells us we shouldn't seek to be rich. Right, 
Right, yes. So that's why, I keep, that's why I keep correcting myself whenever I say the term seek to be rich because nowhere in the Bible they tell us to seek to be rich. So we don't, as Christians, we don't seek to be rich. We seek the kingdom of God. That's what we do. Matthew 6, 33, we seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness and then things are added to us. But then he makes us rich as we seek him. You got that? So as we seek him and his way and his rule and his dominion, then the Bible says the Lord make it rich and add it no sorrow. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Woo, I love it so far. We bless God for that. All right. So we're talking about strategies to eradicate poverty from my life. So who's the adversary in this conflict? The world system, the world and its system. What do I know about me when it comes to poverty? Well, that's an answer you have to do. What do I know about me that helps the adversary to keep me poor? No, don't answer that. Everybody has to answer for themselves. What is it about me that helps the, adver the world, that helps the world to keep me poor? Mm. What is it about me that prevents the world from keeping me in a place of poverty? Now, those are two questions you need to personally answer for yourself. Or both, okay? All right, so let's run on. This poverty that I'm fighting, was it inherited? Was it acquired? Or is it a combination of both? I might have been born into it, but then I might have done some things that have compounded the poverty, made it worse, made it greater. Because mm -hmm. there are people who are born into it and got out of it. Uh-huh. So the poverty isn't always mama's fault and dada's fault. <laughs> Sometimes it's our fault. Yeah, we were born into it. But other people were born into it and got out of it. But we were born into it and some of us do things to keep ourselves in it. All right, running on. Which of the weapons is best suited? And now we're going to talk about weapons and tactical position. Number one, for poverty. And I'm going to say something. It's going to sound controversial. But if you give me some minutes, I'll show you it's scriptural. The first weapon is an offensive weapon that we can use against poverty. And it's called Borrowing. Ha! I knew it. <laughs> Told you it was controversial. Now I'm borrowing not to become a slave to the lender, but I'm borrowing so as to get an advantage. Do you see the difference? So this borrowing we're talking about is not living a lifestyle of borrowing where I'm, I'm forever borrowing so I'm a slave to the lender. This is borrowing so I can get an advantage to pull me out of poverty so I can no longer, I no longer have to borrow anymore. I can now become a lender. Uh-huh. Borrowing. So there are times when we have to borrow. We're going to see that in scripture. This tactical position though, it's reliant upon prayer and favor. If you don't have favor and if you're not prayerful, it won't work it's going to end up being putting you in a place of servitude forever. I'm going to say that again. This strategy is dependent on prayer and favor. Mm -hmm. So if you're not somebody who's prayerful, if you're not someone who seeks the Lord, if you're not someone who has an ear for what God says and when he speaks, and you use this strategy, you will end up being a slave to the lender. So this strategy can't work for everybody. That's why I said those questions, what do I know about me? <laughs> Is this weapon a weapon that's best suited to me? Or I said, no, no. Okay, all right, let's look at some scriptures. Exodus chapter 22 and verse 14, we're not going to turn there. You can read it in your own time, write it in your notes. You're going to see that, that God, you know what, let's turn there. God is not against borrowing. Exodus 22 and 14. The Bible never says that we should not borrow and cannot borrow. What it teaches is do not become a slave to the lender. Okay? Which means don't borrow, borrow forever. That should not be your lifestyle. That's something you do to get yourself out of and get yourself an advantage. But you don't borrow forever. All right. So Exodus chapter 22 and verse 14. I'm just going to read quickly. I feel like my time is running away from me. And if a man borrow aught of his neighbor, neighbor and it be hurt or die, the owner thereof being not with it, he shall surely make it good. 
But if the owner thereof be with it, he shall not make it good. If it be a hired thing, it came for his hire. That's to prove that the Lord had laws that he gave his children concerning how to conduct borrowing. So can he be saying don't borrow if he's telling you how to, to, to manage borrowing? No. So that scripture just to show us that it's okay to borrow. And there are some rules and guidelines surrounding borrowing. All right? Okay, so it speaks against becoming slaves to our borrowers. Deuteronomy 15 and 16. Deuteronomy 15 and 16 for those who are taking notes. And Deuteronomy 28 and 12. You know the one in 28. So I'm not going to read that one because everybody knows that one. Blessed in the city, blessed in the faith, blessed all about. Right. Um, Deuteronomy 15 and 6. Deuteronomy 15, 1, 5, 1, 5, 15 and 6, 1, 5. Six. You know what? Fast is that I'm doing it again. Let's start from verse five. <laughs> Only if thou carefully hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe to do all these commandments which I command thee this day. I was reading from verse five. For the Lord thy God blessed thee as he promised thee and thou shalt lend unto many nations but thou shalt not borrow and thou shalt reign over many nations but they shall not reign over thee. Now, though the Lord does not speak against borrowing, he does teach that being a lender is a blessing. It is a blessing. Everyone does not have that blessing. Being a lender is a blessing that is given to people who will obey God's voice and hearken diligently unto him. Uh -huh. And then notice what, what being a lender followed. What was the thing that followed? The thing that we've been saying all night. Let me read it again. Thou shalt lend unto many nations, but thou shalt not borrow. And thou shalt reign over many nations, but they shall not reign over thee. Does that speak back over to the rich shall rule the poor, and the, the, the borrower shall be servant to the lender? So it's a blessing. He doesn't teach, the Bible doesn't teach against borrowing, but what it does teach is being a lender is a blessing from God. So as children of God, whose goal is for his kingdom to come on earth, we should be aspiring to become lenders. But sometimes the route to becoming a lender is first being a borrower. Because sometimes you're so low in debt, you're so low in poverty that you have nothing to start with. Absolutely nothing. Or what you have is of no significance or use. And so you have to get some kind of capital. You have to get a jump start to start you off. Let's look at some biblical examples. All right? Exodus 3 and 20. Jesus said to the... Exodus 3 and 20. We're not reading it. We're just taking notes. Jesus said to Moses to tell the Israelites, listen, when it's time for them to come out of Egypt, tell the woman to go to their neighbors. Borrow clothes, borrow silver, borrow gold, borrow utensils, borrow this and that and that and that. He says, this is what I'm going to do. He said, I am going to give you favor in their eyes and they're going to give them to you. This borrowing was a borrowing that was going to be a gift. So there are two types of borrowing we're talking about that can be strategies against poverty. It's the borrowing that's associated with favor where people just lend you and tell you don't pay it back. <laughs> oh, Lord, I need to pray some of that into my life. <laughs> Debt forgiveness follow on to this type of borrowing. You borrowed it, and the bank says, listen what, I forgive your debt, no need to pay that back. But that comes with what? God first has to do what? Give what? Favor. God has to give him. Next example, uh, 2 Kings chapter 4 and verse 1 to 7. The woman whose husband was one of the sons of the prophet, 2 Kings 4, 1 to 7. The Bible tells us that her husband was one of the sons of the prophets. Who are the sons of the prophets? Elijah, Elisha, Samuel, they all were heads of schools that trained prophets. And the prophets were called sons of the prophets. All right? And so these men would serve the master prophet, for want of a better term, uh, and they would take care of the business of the master prophet. And so when he died, the husband, who was one of the sons, he left some debts behind. The wife could not pay the debt. She didn't have anything to pay the debt with. And so the creditors came 
to take her sons as bond servants so that they can work off the debt that was owed. She didn't want her sons, because if they go, who's going to provide for her? She's a widow. She's all alone. And so she went to the man of God, the master prophet, and she said, listen here, my husband was one of your servants. My husband was one of the servants that, that worked diligently in the, the school of the prophets. You know him. These people are coming to get my sons. What am I supposed to do? She was in a place of poverty. She did not have enough resources to meet their needs. What did Elisha tell her to do? In the name of Jesus, let money fall down from heaven. Was that what he said? <laughs> no. He said, what do you have in your house? She said, all I have is a little bit of oil in a bottle. He said, this is what you're going to do. You're going to go to your neighbors. You are going to borrow as many bottles as you can. Mm -hmm. Take those bottles, carry them into your house, shut the door. You and your sons take the little oil that you have and pour it out into all those bottles. What craziness is this? I just told you I have a little bit of oil in a bottle. And you're telling me to take the little bottle oil in the bottle and pour it into all these bottles I'm going to get from my neighbors. How? What did I say that th th this borrowing thing has to do with? Prayer and favor. And as I studied, I said, Lord, help me. Help me, Lord. Forgive me for not knowing this intelligence before. Whenever we borrow, we need to borrow with prayer and make sure there is favor. <coughs> hmm? So she went and borrowed. Did the neighbors Give her bottles? Yes. Did she go into her room with her sons and lock the door? Yes. Did they by faith start to pour out the oil? Yes. What did the Bible say? Did it say that the oil multiplied and multiplied? It told us that she poured and the oil didn't stop running until the last bottle was filled. When the last bottle was filled, the oil stopped. She went back to the man of God and asked him, what do we do now? He said, go and sell the oil, pay your debt, live off the rest. What was the borrowing supposed to do? Keep her in a place of borrowing? What was the borrowing supposed to do? Eradicate poverty out of her life, leave her with excess so she will have no need to borrow anymore. Are you see what I'm saying here? So borrowing is one way that we can fight. It's a strategy that we can use to come out of poverty, but we must use it prayerfully and make sure that we are going with the favor that God has released for us. Make sure we do that. Going with the favor that God has released for us. Second Kings chapter 6 verse 1 to 7 is another story. Again, the sons of the prophets, the story was about. Elisha was with them. They, they looked around them and they said here. They said, the place where we dwell is too small. We have Second Kings 6, 1 to 7. We have outgrown the capacity for our house. Don't make nobody make you feel bad if you need a bigger house. Don't make nobody make you feel bad if you need a bigger car. The question is, why do you need it? Is it that I need it because I'm running with the Joneses and I'm competing with everybody else? Or is it I need it because the assignment that I'm on has been growing and therefore I need more? If we live in a one bedroom and I have three children, my God, I need a bigger house. This is, this is not me being greedy and covetous. This is not me running with the Joneses. This is that the assignment that I have for being fruitful and multiplying, I have been working it, I have been growing in it, and now I need a bigger space. It's a need. So they said, listen, the space that we are in is too small for us. We need 2 Kings 6, 1 to 7. We, need, we have outgrown this space. We have outgrown our environment. So we want to go somewhere else and build something bigger. Would you come with us, man of God? What did I say? Every time you see borrowing in scripture, there's always some symbolism of prayer or a connection with God with it. It's never done in the absence of the man of God or in the absence of prayer. Because this strategy requires a voice from God. It requires direction from God. And it, require, it requires God opening up favor on our behalf. So, they went and they went in the forest to cut down some beans, some, limb, some, some timber, so that they can build a bigger facility. The Bible says that all of a sudden, Elisha heard one of the sons of the prophet shouting out, Oh my gosh! Alas! 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 It was borrowed! It was borrowed! It was borrowed! And everybody's wondering what's going on. 
He had bought, he did not have the tools needed for the assignment. The assignment was all of us are going to go and expand the work. He didn't have the tools for the assignment, so he went and borrowed it from his neighbor. And there are times we don't have the tools necessary to fulfill an assignment that we are given. So he went and borrowed it from a neighbor, and now the axe fell down in the water, and it was sinking. Now, what am I going to do? I didn't have money to buy one for myself. <laughs> I borrowed one from somebody. Now I'm going to need to buy one for myself and buy back the one that I just lost. That's why he was shouting out, because, listen, the fact I borrowed it was because I didn't have what it took to get one. How am I going to replace this man's axe that I borrowed? And so when he shouted out, the man of God said, okay the bible says he put a, a branch in the water and miraculously the axe floated back up to the surface he took it up and gave it to him uh-huh so it could be returned to what, what are we saying here there are time when our assignments require us to borrow because we do not have what we need but that borrowing is a strategy that we don't use lightly we use it under the advisement of god and we make sure that favor is with us so that when things go bad <laughs> favor can pull us out. The person can say, All right, it's okay, you don't have to pay me back. It's okay, that was on me. Hmm? Bless God. Borrowing is a strategy to get us out of. It's an offensive strategy. All right. Many times that which is asked for or needed may be given as a loan, like I said. At other times it may be given as a gift. And I wrote this in my studies, because I am famous for this. Do not ally, allow false humility or pride to cause you to refuse what is being offered. Because sometimes, that's God pulling you out of poverty. That's God's way of giving you the victory. Mm -hmm. So don't say, no, it's okay. No, it's okay. I'm okay. What are you trying to say? I got this. No, it's okay. No, bother with that. Don't bother with that. If you know you are in need and someone is blessing you and telling you you don't have to pay me back, you can keep that. Say, to God be the glory. That's what Pastor Alex was talking about. The strategy where I'm given a loan that I don't have to pay back. It is a gift to pull me out of poverty. That is the favor of God that came as a result of the prayer that I was praying. Because borrowing works with prayer and with favor. Nehemiah can tell you about that. Remember Nehemiah chapter 1? He prayed. He said, Lord, give me favor in the sight of this king. Give me favor in the sight of the king. Give me favor in the sight of the king. He went to the king in chapter 2 of Nehemiah and the king says, tell me what is your request. You know, I, I, I left out some parts. Hmm? The king says, how long you want to stay? What do you want? Boom. He didn't have to pay back. Borrowing. All right. We're good with that? So one of the strategies to get out of poverty is what? Borrowing. We borrow to borrow forever. We borrow to do what? To get an advantage to eradicate poverty like that. Just think the woman with the, the oil. So I can sell off my debt, I get, get rid of my debt, and live off of the excess. Never to be in debt anymore. All right. Second strategy. It's also an offensive strategy. This one is investing in the kingdom. What's the second way that I can fight against poverty and I can get re -erad eradicate poverty out of my life? Invest in the kingdom. All right. My examples are, I'm going to have to read this one because this one we're not quite familiar with. So I'm going to read this one and I'm going to pair it with ones that we are familiar with. Second Kings chapter 4. Second Kings chapter 4. Second Kings chapter 4. Starting from verse 38. And I said tonight was my last night, but things look rough. Oh, <laughs> bless the Lord. Ready? 2 Kings 4 from verse 38. And Elisha came again to Gilgal, and there was a dearth. The King James says dearth, but that word means famine. Okay? There was a famine in the land. So do you think there was poverty? You think the people are experiencing some needs? Their basic needs weren't being met? Mm-hmm. All right. So there was a famine in the land, and the sons of the prophets were sitting before him. And he said unto his servant, set on the great pot, 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 38, and see the pottage for the sons of the prophets. So, so, so Elisha is saying, okay, things hard. Yeah, but I have all these men in my school of prophets. Um, he said to his servant, put some water on the fire. Let me see if I can get some food for them to eat. 
one of them went out into the field to gather herbs. Mm -hmm. So you get, you get some bush, you know, some things, you know, those of us on the Caribbean, you know where that go. So we can cook some food, <laughs> vegetables, and found a wild vine and gathered thereof while gourds his lap full and came in and shred them in the pot of pottage for they knew them not. So they were so hungry that they're out there pulling up things to cook, not knowing that they pulled up something that was poisonous. Hmm. So they poured out for the men to eat. This is after the soup was finished. Everybody now pouring out and eating. And it came to pass as they were eating, somebody cried out. So the last time the man cried, oh Lord, oh Lord, it was borrowed. Remember they asked? No, somebody is crying out, these prophets. And they really had a drama going on. Oh Lord, death is in the pot. <laughs> oh, what a thing. They said, oh, though man of God, there is death in the pot. And they had to stop eating the food. Now how they knew it was death. How do you think they knew it was death? People probably started looking like they were going to die, vomiting, carrying on, you know, it's all poisonous. Uh -huh. He said to them, bring me, then bring meal. Meal would be like um, flour, corn, meal, some kind of grain. And he cast it in the pot and he said, pour out for the people that they may eat. And there was no harm in the pot. All right, that's not the, the crux of the story. I'm trying to go somewhere with it. I'm trying to set the context of what they were living. They were living in a time of famine. They were living in a time of what? Famine. People were suffering needs so badly that here it is, people in their hunger went and just pulled wildly stuff to cook, not thinking because of how poverty will make you do crazy things. You know that? When you're hungry, when the bank tells you they're coming to possess your house, repossess your house and repossess your car, you do some things that normally when you're in your right mind you would not have done. Women have sold their bodies to feed their children, not because they ever dared say I was going to live the life of a prostitute. But in order for their child to eat, things were so bad that they sold themselves so their children could eat. Things you would not imagine you would do, poverty would let you do it. Uh, you don't know with this? Poverty is terrible. It's a terror, and we need to get out of it. Verse 42. There came a man from Baal Shalisha. This is what we're talking about, investing in the kingdom. And brought the man of God bread of the first fruits. 20 loaves of barley and full ears of corn in the husk thereof. It's a time of a famine. He could have said, it's a time of famine. And man of God, you have to understand. I know I'm supposed to bring my first fruit, but it's famine. My family can do well with this barley. It's famine. My family can do well with these ears of corn. It's famine. He could have said that. But he chose instead to invest in the kingdom, to invest in the man of God. This is what happens. And he said, the man of God said, give unto the people that they may eat. And his servitor, the person who's serving out the food, said, What should I set before this? No, what should I set this before 100 men? The band bring 20 liquor loaves of bread hmm? and some corn. And I'm supposed to set that before 100 grown men. <laughs> what is that? <laughs> hmm? Elijah said again, Give the people that they may eat. For thus saith the Lord, they shall eat and shall leave. They're all, which means what? They're going to have left over. Doesn't it sound like a, a, a New Testament miracle? Which New Testament miracle it sounds like? Jesus and the feeding of the 5,000 and the, the 4,000. Mm -hmm. Same thing, Old Testament. Anything we see in the New Testament, you can find it in the Old Testament. You sure can. So he set it before them and they did eat and left thereof according to the word of the Lord. These people had leftovers. Does it sound like the woman with the oil? Any strategy you use to come out of poverty based on the word of God that I've studied so far, he not only takes you out of poverty, meet your need, but there's always extra left over. Why do you think he gives you the extra left over? Based on what we're studying tonight. To keep you out of poverty. But what do we do with the extra that's left over? Who, who knows what we does with it? We eat it off. <laughs> we waste it. Mm? Uh, we give it away. <laughs> not so. He says he gives bread to the eat and seed to the sower, which means he gives us two things. He gives us bread to meet our need, and he gives you extra so you can plant, so you can have bread next week. So you're not coming back every minute borrowing bread from people. Not so. All right. So this thing about investing in the kingdom is a strategy. Pastor Thad and I have a testimony. I think we mentioned it on the YouTube channel in our um, ordained, God ordained shift testimonies. Pastor Tad and I were going through a very rough time. Barely anything. That's when Pastor Tad learned to 
cook exceptionally well. <laughs> Flour became our friend because, you know, Flour can stretch. And he learned how to bake bread and how to do all kinds of things with Flour so me and the children could have food to eat. But in spite of the fact that we were going through such a hard financial time, our church taught at the first month, at the end of the first month, was it? Mm -hmm. Of the year, which is January, we are supposed to give first fruits. And the first fruits that we gave was what? Mm -hmm. we, uh, one week salary you give, the first week salary you give for the year. And that should cover the whole year. I'm telling you, we didn't have it in terms of on a daily basis. But we sacrificed and we gave out 1200 Long story short, Pastor Thad, some time later, was up for a promotion. Pastor Thad, you can tell the testimony better than I can. <laughs> he got an increase. The increase was what? Uh-huh. He got a job. That's how we were able to sow our first fruit of $1,200. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. All right. Now, if it was in multiples of the first fruit, was it the 1,200? What was it? It was 1,200 times. It was more than a year. I, actually, it was a 13 months. We got 13 months of $1,200 increase, back paid. If you invest in the kingdom, he gives you what you need plus extra. And that money was some of the money that helped us transition to the U.S. <laughs> when, we, when we transitioned in 2013. Uh-huh. So he meets the need. When you invest in the kingdom, he does what? Meet the need and there is excess left over because the excess is supposed to keep you out of poverty. I wanted the church hearing me tonight. Alex, are you hearing Alex? Are you hearing the Holy Spirit tonight? The excess is to keep you out of poverty. So you're not a borrower again. You can start to make your way to being a what? A lender. All right. What am I talking about? Investing in the kingdom. First Kings 17 is another example. That was the way of Zarephath. We're not going to turn there because of time. Remember? Elijah, Elijah said, bake me a cake first. Remember that story? Elijah said it was another famine time. Again, it was drought. Elijah says to Ahab, there will be no rain. There will be nothing until I say it. God sent him down to the river, the brook Sherith, sorry. A raven used to bring bread for him. Then the river dried up, the brook dried up. God said, all right, get up, go to Zarephath. I have commanded a woman there to sustain you. He walks into the, the village. The woman is at the, 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 the city, at the, the, the gate of the city, picking up sticks because she only have a little bit of meal and a little bit of oil to make her last meal. And he said, listen here, if you make a cake for me first, mm -hmm, you and your child shall live. Guess what? She invested in the man of God, which is the kingdom. And the Bible says, for as long as the famine lasted, her house was provided for. Their need was met. Why? Because she invested in the kingdom. What's the next strategy for getting out of poverty? Investing in the kingdom. Now, all of these things I'm telling you, you they have to be accompanied by prayer. Because there are things that look like kingdom. <laughs> but it's not kingdom. There are people who carry the name man of God and prophet, and they're not man of God or prophet. Females as well, I just use that you know, um, generally. Huh? So these strategies must be accompanied by prayer. Running on. We're still talking about how to get out of poverty. Work what you have. That's the next strategy. Diligence, diligence. Work in what you have. Diligence. Proverbs 12 and 24. Pastor Tad, can you give us that? Stop saying I don't have anything to work with. You know, COVID-19 showed people this principle more than anything else. Because people got laid off their jobs and they had to find creative ways to make money. And they found it. If there was no COVID-19, some of these people would still be saying, I don't have anything. I don't have anything. I don't have, but when there was no boss to give them anything, they had to find something in their house that they could use. People who had the ability to braid hair started braiding hair for a business, and now they have a salon. Uh huh. People who could cook food. I have a friend, a minister friend. She said to me when she got married and moved to another um, country to be with her husband, she said, Pastor Alex, things were so bad. 
for us. That I had to, I, I couldn't get a job. My husband was the only person that was working and his money wasn't enough. She said, I had to find a way to help him. And she said, I started baking. <laughs> and would just tell people and go and try to, and sell to people. No, she has a baking business. What was she doing? She was working what she had. She had a talent. She had like a flower in her house, a baking powder, like whatever. She put what she had together, worked it, and kept at it eh, until God transformed it into a what? A business. Work what you have. This is another strategy for, for poverty that gets us all. It's an offensive strategy. It's called diligent. Do we have Proverbs 12 and 24 up? It says, the hand of the diligent shall bear rule, but the slothful shall be on the tribute. When you put your hand to work, what does diligent mean? Be steady, be serious, be constant, and be careful. A diligent worker is somebody who works steadily, constantly, seriously, and carefully, which means you're not wasting things. Uh -huh. So he says when your hand is diligent, you're going to move into a place of what? Rulership. But when you're slothful, you're dragging foot, you're in your bed, you can't get up. Oh, Lord, you don't understand. I say, I don't have anything. What do you want me to do? Kill? Uh, well, I tell you, I don't have it. That's how some people are. I'm just waiting for the Lord to come through. Well, trust me, you're going to stay there. <laughs> because every principle that I see in the Bible that eradicates poverty, everything has to do with you getting up off of your nice little fanny and doing something under the guidance of God. Mm -hmm. So diligence is a way to get us out of poverty. Keep at it. It might look like it's not working. Keep at it. The scripture can't lie. If you're diligent in a thing, you're going to be a rule. If all you can do is do box braids, don't compete with people who can do Sengalese twist and what else? Mm, corn roll, tell me some more. Huh? And Congo and French braid. Stop it. If box braid is what you can do, be diligent at box braid. Trust me, you're going to be known in the village as the specialist of box braid. You're going, you are going to corner the market on box braid because guess what? Practice makes permanent. And while, while everybody else, their hands twisting between Sengalese, cornrow, box braid, they're not becoming proficient in any. But because that's the only thing you do night and day, after a while, you are going to become the expert at box braiding. And you're going to have a niche for yourself. Be diligent. Stop comparing yourself. What do you have in your house? No matter how small and insignificant it looks, it's yours. It means that's your weapon that God has given you to get you out of poverty. Uh -huh. Work it. Be diligent. Hmm? Lazy, 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 going to keep you in poverty. It's going to keep you in a place of tribute. All right. That was number three. What's number three? One was borrowing. Two was investing in the kingdom. Three was working what you have. Diligence. Number four, instruction. How can I get out of poverty? What's a strategy that God has given in the Bible to get out of poverty? Instruction. All right. Job chapter 36. Pastor Thad, can you give us that one? Job 36. Job 36 and verse 15. I'm reading from the Amplified, but he'll probably show you it from the King James. I'm not sure what translation he has up there. Well, this is Amplified Classic. You know, they have a couple of different Amplifieds. Job 36 and 15. What am I talking about? Instruction. Job 36 and 15. There's nothing wrong with going to a financial planner, folks. There's nothing wrong with going to a financial advisor. There's nothing wrong with going to a seminar, but make sure it's godly people, eh? Because... If they're not godly, they're going to give you principles that are not kingdom principles. And so you will not be displaying the kingdom. All right? But there's nothing wrong. Find Christian advisors. Find Christian financial planners. Find Christians who are giving seminars on how to work your money. Because that's a strategy in the Bible that God has given to get us out of poverty. Job 36, what did I say? And verse 15. It says, he delivers the afflicted in their affliction. And open their ears to his voice in adversity. When you are in a time of adversity, in poverty, in oppression and affliction, he opens up your ears so that you can hear. You can hear what? Instruction. You can hear what? Instruction. Let's look at Proverbs 13 and 18. 
Sometimes to fight against poverty, we need what? Instruction. Proverbs 13 and 18. 13 and 18 says, Poverty and shame shall be to him that refuseth instruction. Simple. Poverty and shame shall be to him that refuseth instruction. Some people, they, they pour until and they're proud. We, yeah, we call them poor boys. Come, let me tell you a little thing. No, it's okay. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I'm fine. I, they, there was this thing in Antigua when I was young. I don't know if it's still a thing. You would see people who live in a house that's small. It's a wooden house, small, broken down. You can stay outside and look through a hole in their house, into their house. And in front of their house is a pathfinder, a Lexus. Not old one, a new one. And I just scratch my head and ask myself, Children upon children pack up in the holy house. And that holy meaning sanctified. Holy meaning filled with holes. If hurricane pass, that's it. Granted, some of these old houses stand up on the hurricane. And you have a Lexus park outside your house. What is wrong with you? You lack instruction. Huh? Somebody had to have spoken to that person. And they refuse instruction. Because wisdom would tell you Antigua is a small place. Take the bus. Walk to town. But do something about the house that you, the money you take and buy the Lexus, fix your house. No? And then they wonder why they die and then their child grow up and be poor. And then they die and some, because the same folly passes down from generation. It's, it becomes a learned behavior that's ingrained in them. Because what? They despise. And you talk to them and say, I'm not bothering with you. I have to support her. I have, people, I have to make people know that you know what when they see your house they will know something that you think that they don't know <laughs> they, don't, they don't know come on what, what are we doing here and it's the same thing I mean I, 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 know, I, just, I just knock my Antiguans I'm going to knock the African Americans now I will see them wearing shoes that cost $400 and they can't buy lunch at school what is wrong with us we enjoy poverty. Look, when I came up to America first, and this is a side note, I came up at 16 to go to college. And I used to sit next to this boy of another race. I'm telling you, the boy's shoe looked like it had seen certain centuries. It was used. Boy came to school, and I used to think to myself, that boy has to really have it bad, man. He must be poor. You know what I found out before we graduated? He was one of the richest people in the school. Because, you know, the rich people don't waste their money on $408, $100 shoes. They, 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 they invest their money in things that matter, that can keep them out of poverty. Because shoe can't keep me out of poverty. It keeps me in poverty. And Christians, you know what, who did I say poverty? was the adversary that, that fights us? The world. Christians follow the world system. The world says that you have to drive a kind of car. You have to live in a kind of house even though you don't need it. You have to wear certain name brand clothes. You have to have certain hairstyle. You have to, you have to, you have to. That's the, your nails have to be, I, my nails, my nails aren't done, people. And it's okay because guess what? I want to make sure my light stays on. I want to make sure that when my children come to age that they need a car to get to college, they can have a car. They're not begging car ride all over and end up being, being, being left vulnerable to be raped and molested and all sorts of things. So guess what? I'll forego my nails so that something hmm, can set me up in a place where I can rule. When I get to a place of dominion, I'll do my nails. Gotcha? Uh, there'll be time for that. When the Lord give me the excess and I've already executed huh, my not becoming a debtor again, I can do my nails. I'm not saying to walk around looking trashy, don't get me wrong, because I don't look trashy. Do I look trashy? No. But what I'm saying is, listen to instruction. Listen to instruction. And people will talk. To, I have spoken to people and they say, Pastor, you need to do better. Do better with what? You need to fix your hair more often. Your husband, my husband and I are both striving to get out of poverty. He will understand. He prefers to get out of poverty than for my hair to be done every weekend. The pastor said he cuts his own hair. That's right. He invested in a barbering machine. I don't even know what they call it. I call it a barbering machine. <laughs> he invested in a barbering machine. There you go. 
so that he can cut my son, his son's hair and his hair. Imagine having to give a barber $20 for both of their heads every weekend. That's $40 a weekend. That's $160 a month. Huh? For a year, that's nearly $2,000. Over, that's over $2,000. Come on! Re receive instruction. Receive instruction. When the old woman is teaching you how to cook, learn how to cook so you don't have to give all of your money to the restaurant chef who already is a, a millionaire. You, you follow me going with this? And I know it sounds practical, but guess what? The, the, the Lord gives us what we need to be successful in the earth and we reject it and we choose the world system. Uh -huh. The world system says, if, if I carry a bag of lunch to school, everybody's going to laugh at me. So what are you going to do? Spend money on lunch when there's food in your house you could have taken with you and saved that money for college? Because everybody's going to laugh at you because you have a bag of lunch? Come on! I am not of this world. I don't go by the systems of this world. That's right. The world will keep us in poverty. And guess who's going to get rich in this world? Its own. But it's designed to keep us. But what does the Bible say? I, I know I sound like I'm fussing at y'all. I am fussing at y'all. <laughs> Bless the Lord. The Bible says what? That what? Poverty and shame shall be to those who refuse instruction. Instruction is a strategy to get out of poverty, folks. You hear me? Instruction is a strategy. When the people in them come to your workplace and they're giving you seminars on insurance, now just say you fall asleep and then you just circle anything. Huh? Listen, because you're going to end up and pay for it. Listen. I, the church circles that I have grown up around are one of the most, let me put it back. Let me leave that alone. Moving on. <laughs> we don't like instruction. We don't like knowledge. We love foolishness. We love fool. Anything that's foolish, we run with and say Holy Ghost and we get excited and we dip. And we do not embrace instruction. Instruction will get you out of poverty. Instruction will get you out of poverty. Pastor, that is, is, I'm having a hard time with us at the house because he's instructing us how to use the water and how to use the AC and how to use the different things. And some of us are not receiving that instruction. <laughs> Woo, bless the Lord. Amen. The last one is a defensive strategy. All of those were offensive. All of those were things that you would do to defeat and eradicate poverty. This last one is what I'm going to do to manage huh? a defensive one. So this one secures what I already have. Mm -hmm. So this strategy is called um, management. I call it waste management. Okay. Management using kingdom principles. We just talked about the leftovers, right? Elisha had talked about leftovers. Jesus in John chapter 6 when the boy gave his lunch, five loaves and two fishes. Remember what Jesus said? Now that everybody finished eat, we're not going to sit down and have a party and talk about the miracle. Get up, get some baskets, and go pick up all them leftovers. <laughs> Guess what? Because there's going to be another revival. We're going to have another teaching session. People are going to be hungry again. Huh? And who? I can't keep borrowing somebody lunch to be producing miracle after miracle. The, the, the strategy he was teaching is that when he meets your needs, what's left over, save it. Gather it. Collect it. Do not let it waste. Hmm? So you're doing here. Let's go back to the girl who's doing box braids. You're doing here. Somebody's pack had a little bit of extra. And they say, you can hold on to that. You know, just toss it aside and make your little tree or girl play with it and play dolly house. No, 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 no. You put that aside. Because now you can be the hairdresser who when somebody runs out and don't have enough, you can be generous to say, here, don't worry, I, I can take care of that. And guess what? You just open the door for more customers. Hmm? Because you didn't waste. That which could have been wasted, you kept and it opened up a door for more for you. Saving. Saving what is left. The second principle, Proverbs 6. Proverbs 6, 4 to 11. Oh, Lord. Folks, I said tonight was the last night, but you know, folks, I got excited on poverty. Is this good? 
Sh should I make it the last night? Should I do next week what I had? Next week we had barrenness and yeah, to do, but you know. All right, six, 40, 11. This is the story of the ants. Remember the ants? John hates ants. <laughs> oh, he despises them royally. Ants. In Proverbs chapter 6. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 4. Give not sleep to your eyes, nor slumber to your eyelids, which means you know, be just there lying down in sleep all day and not giving yourself to anything of industry. Deliver yourself as a roe from the hand of the hunter and as a bird from the hand of the fowl. And he's talking about warfare. A hunter hunts the deer so as to kill it, right? The fowler is the person who sets the trap for the bird so as to catch it, right? Just so the world system, because we're talking about poverty, has set traps for us and is hunting us so he can trap us and kill us, huh? So that we cannot get to that place of rulership so that his kingdom can come and his will can be done through us, so our voices can be heard. So now he's going to give us an analogy or a parable to show us how to deliver ourselves from that trap. Okay, ready? Go to the ant, thou sluggard, and consider her ways and be wise. The ants, they have no guide. They don't have an overseer. They don't have a ruler. They provide their meat in the summer and gather their food in the harvest. Hmm? What do they do? When it is plentiful, they do what? Gather, 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 gather. Because they know a time is going to come when what? It's going to be winter. It's going to be cold. And they're not going to be able to have access to food like they have in the summer. Hmm? This is a principle that the Lord teaches us when it comes to managing using kingdom principles. So kingdom principles, say, people would say, the world would say, oh, you got extra money now. <laughs> Take your family on a vacation. That's true. You have extra money now? Go on a shopping spree. You have extra money now? Take five days off of work without pay and just relax. Mm -hmm. you have to tell me some more things we do when we have extra money. You all, you all know how we are. That's right. You have extra money? Let's go girls shopping. Let's get us some shoes. Let's have a spa day. Huh? <laughs> Oh, yeah, that's right. Every tax season. Your tax return check is coming. Come on, let's get a new car. <laughs> what did we forget? What did we forget? That there's going to come a time when we're not going to have enough, much less to have extra, because the Bible says there's a time and place for everything on the sun. There's a season for everything. There's never always a season for fullness, fullness. But, when the dry season comes, I don't have to be in lack. If, like the ant, during the full season, I gathered and kept some for the dry season, when everybody else is feeling the effects of the dry season, I'm safe. Not because I'm not in a dry season too, but because I made provision for that season. That's right, like Joseph, by managing the plenty that I have. Mm -hmm. So this is a defensive strategy. It's a strategy of securing what you already have. So, you paid off your credit card. What do you do now? <laughs> Somebody say, use it up again, run it up again. Would that be the defensive? You hide it. You put it, yeah, one of two things. You either cut it up or... You put it somewhere where you have no access to it because it's there for a, uh, if you have to borrow to get yourself an advantage. But you put it away. Give it to somebody that you know you can trust. Put it in a safety deposit box. <laughs> until it passes, I say, until it becomes the right weapon. I like that pastor tag. It becomes that weapon that is useful. You see what I'm saying? You don't keep it. And that was my, I, I, I have fallen in that condemnation. The Lord knows. Yes, I, I cleared it off and, oh, Pastor Alex. Pastor Alex is the first thing that you because she doesn't know what she's saying. She's been there. She's been bitten sometimes by this. I know what I'm saying. Huh? You, you pay off the credit card. I'm not saying to get rid of it. If you can, get rid of it. If you can't, secure it somewhere. Pastor Alex says it becomes the right weapon. Then you work on clearing up. The extra that you had that you were paying on this one, you work on paying off 
the next one, yeah? Another one. So guess what? In the world system, you look as if your credit score going up. But in the kingdom system, you're not a slave to the borrower. You're coming out of slavery. So I'm living by the kingdom system, and I'm taking advantage of the world system so that I can be what? In a place of rulership. So my voice can be heard. So now we can go to a conference with business, but I can accompany Pastor Thad, amen, to one of those, you know, business financial conferences. And when everybody's going out to dinner, we don't have to look like we love a God. <laughs> you know, we can pay for a meal without wondering if it's going to be declined. <laughs> yeah. Pastor, I said, you don't want gold or platinum. Well, we can butt heads with the people of the world, but know that we're living by kingdom principles. Are we, are we good with that? So, all right. So, we're coming to a close. Proverbs. I'm, I'm, all I'm going to do is money tonight. Poverty, that's all we have time for tonight. But we're coming to a close. Let's look at a couple more scriptures. Proverbs 24, 13, and I'm coming down. Proverbs 24, 13. We're just going to read some about poverty and diligence. I hope I bless somebody. I know I bless me. That I didn't bless me. The Holy Ghost blessed me. Because if you look at my notes, this, I taught from here to here. So, you know, all them things I say is the Holy Ghost had to help me out. Because it's only half of the page I taught. <laughs> Bless the Lord. Thank you, Holy Ghost. He taught me. I love him. He will never leave me hanging. He always makes sure that he gives me while he's giving you all. Bless you. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Proverbs 24, 30. I went by the field of the slothful. Proverbs 24, 30. 3, 0. I went by the field of the slothful and by the vineyard of the man void of understanding. You know, I was talking about, sometimes I act that way when it comes to money, like I'm void of understanding. I'm just going to tell on myself, you know? And lo, it was all grown over with thorns, and nettles had covered the face thereof, and the stone wall thereof was broken down. Then I saw and considered it well. I looked upon it and received instruction. Solomon is saying, I went past this field. No, no, it's not that a man did not have something. He had what? A field. He had something to work with. But what was the problem? He was thoughtful. He was lazy. He had no ambition. He did not want to work. And so Solomon said, I passed this man's field, and when I look at the field, the field is all overgrown. Thorns are in the field. Nettles cover the field. And Paul Solomon said, I looked at this and I received instruction. It taught me something. No, he didn't teach the man who owned it, but he taught Solomon. What did Solomon learn from that field? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little holding and folding of the hands to sleep. So shall thy poverty come as one that traveleth and thy want as an armed man. He is describing how the spirit of poverty moves. The spirit of poverty travels <laughs> and it comes in like an armed man, like a soldier. What is he coming in to do? What does a soldier come into a territory to do? Either this kill, destroy, or bring on the subjugation, right? And bring us captives. Poverty is seeking for people who it can conquer and subdue. Who qualifies for poverty to, 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 to conquer and conquer? People who are slothful. People who are lazy. People who won't work what God gave them to work. Not diligent. What do we say diligent means? Steady, constant, serious, and a careful worker. Mm -hmm. This guy wasn't serious with what he had. He wasn't careful with what he had. He was busy, what, folding his hands, sleeping and slumbering. And so what he has got, take, got taken over by thorns and by thistles. And poverty was making its way closer and closer to him to take him into captivity. Once poverty has you, it doesn't let you go easy. I know what I'm saying. Those of us who sometimes are living by the kingdom principles, we're trying, we're tithing, we're sowing our seeds. We're living according to the word of God. And it seems like it's such a hard thing to break. Because when it holds you, it holds you like an armed man. A strong warrior who means that once he gets you, he's not letting you go. Proverbs 28 and 19. We have four more scriptures and then we're done. Proverbs 28, 19. 28, 19. 
He that tilleth his land. What does he mean by tilleth his land? The person who works his land. What we, God, God keeps saying over and over, work what I give you. Your land is whatever I give you. I give you a talent, work it. I give you children, work them. I give you a ministry, whatever I put in your When I say work your children, I don't mean like have them like... <laughs> I don't mean like have them like slave labor and have them working on in the field. I'm talking about do be diligent about appearance in terms of forming them, molding them. Work whatever God gives you. He that tilleth his land shall have plenty of bread. But he that followeth after vain persons shall have poverty enough. Some of your friends, you need to tell them, leave me alone. You go about your business and I'll go mine. Because when you follow worthless people, Vain people, people who have no ambition, people who have no goal, people who are just satisfied with whatever happens, happens. It says that poverty is going to come upon you. Did we talk about inherited poverty and acquired poverty? Some of us were working hard, but we acquired a poverty from our best friend. We, ac we acquire it from our cousin that we can't keep from. And the cousin is a vain person. When I say vain, I'm not talking about, yeah, I'm just vain. I'm talking about foolish, ignorant. They don't know kingdom principles. They don't live by the word of God. And you follow them and not work what God has given you, you end up in poverty. Proverbs 12 and 27. Proverbs 12, 12 and 27. The slothful man roasted not that which he took in hunting. Now that's foolishness. I went hunting. I got me some deer. I, I don't eat deer. But, you know, in South Carolina it's deer. I went hunting and I got me deer meat. And I'm just sitting down there, staring at the deer meat. And I just, somehow it's going to get roasted. Somehow I'm going to be fed by it. Proverbs is saying, Solomon is saying that uh, this is the, the action of lazy people. We go out in warfare, we, we go on our knees and we pray. I, I rebuke the spirit of poverty. I bind and I loose what is mine in the name of Jesus. I reject lack. Oh my God, my God, I am blessed and highly. You put all the energy in your prayer. That's you going hunting. And then you do nothing after with what you hunted. You're sitting down and you're waiting for the roasting to happen. How? Who's going to roast the deer for you? <laughs> Who is going to go out there and do the things that we talked about? Who's going to employ? Because prayer sets you in a right position. Prayer sets you up for success. But you, the Bible tells me, have to make your way prosperous. And you have to get the good success. So prayer positions you in a place of favor so that you are in the environment for success. But then you have to put the strategies in place so that success can be manifested and come forward. Not so? Don't be slow for people. Let's, let's, let's bind. Tonight when we pray, we're going to pray against that spirit of slothfulness, sluggishness, sleep. All the things that I tell them. It's not necessarily, but yes, for some people it's sleep. For some people it's sleep. Some people sleep for 12 hours in the day and work for four and wonder why they're poor. But you know what? I'm moving on. Proverbs 13 and 4, I'm just going to read. The soul of the slugger desireth and has nothing. Proverbs 13 and 4. The soul of the slugger desires and have nothing. What does that mean? Always wanting something. I want a big house. I want a car. I want a wife. Which woman going to marry you? <laughs> you can't even take care of yourself. Eh? Every time you look around the bank, we're possessing your car. I see in a different car. What happened to your car, bro? Um, you know, you know, you know. <laughs> Every time your address change. Oh, you living in Hanahan now? <laughs> I'm just spending some time with a, fr with a friend, you know. <laughs> Can't keep nothing. Have nothing of your own, but you want to get married. And you women, you're just as bad. You don't know how to spend money and you want to get married. Don't know how to pay a bill, and you want to get married. Don't know how to turn a pot, and you want to get married. I'm moving on. The soul of the slugger desire it. That's what I'm talking about. The slothful, lazy person, all they do, they desire, and they get nothing. They have nothing. But, what's the word that's coming? The soul of the diligent shall be made fat. When I work, when I put my hand to the plow, and I put prayer on that, guess what? Fatness is coming. Fatness. I, I'm prophesying to myself, Lord, you know, I get up and go work every day. <laughs> Lord, even when I don't feel like it, I go to work. Oh, Lord, yes. And I'm diligent at my work. My soul needs to be fat. 
it needs to be made fast. Last one, the thoughts of the diligent. Proverbs 21 and verse 5. The thoughts of the diligent tend only to plenteousness, which means what I'm inclined to, plenteousness. I think about how can I become more productive? How can I take what I have and make it more? That's what the thoughts of the diligent is. But of everyone that is hasty, it leads to lack or to want. We thank God tonight. We're going to review, Pastor Carlos, where that, that, was, that slide should have been at the review. We are going to review quickly our five, was it five strategies I gave us? Five strategies uh -huh, to battle the spirit of poverty, the warfare against poverty. First strategy, borrow so as to get an advantage. This strategy is used with prayer and favor. It's de determined or dependent on prayer and favor. Second strategy, invest in the kingdom. Invest in the kingdom. When you invest in the kingdom, God will eradicate your poverty and give you extra on top. Mm -hmm. Bless the Lord. Three, be diligent. Work what you have. Work what you have. Be serious, be earnest, be steady, be constant, be careful. Work what you have. And when you are diligent, the Bible says it's going to lead you to a place of rulership. Number four, receive instruction. Receive instruction. Those who do not receive instruction, poverty and shame, shall be the portion. And the last one, all, four, all those four were offensive strategies. These are strategies that I get up and use to eradicate poverty, to fight against poverty, to attack poverty in my life. Those four strategies. And the last strategy was a defensive strategy. I use that to secure what I already have. So I am brought back into a place of poverty or more poverty. And that is management using kingdom principles, which is what gathering, what's left over managing so that you don't waste, and preparing for the bad day or the evil day. All right. We started out by saying the goal of our warfare, the goal of me getting out of poverty is what? Why am I trying to get out of poverty? Why do I need to be rich? So my voice can be heard. So I can be at a place of rulership. Mm -hmm. So his kingdom can come in me and it can be dispersed in the earth. When we become the business owners, then businesses are run by God's principle. Mm -hmm. When we become the, 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 the school masters, people opening schools and educational instit institutions, guess what? God's principles and his reign begins to be manifested in the earth. That's how his kingdom is going to come on this earth. And then his will can be expressed through your life. Who's coming, Pastor Thad or Apostle? Pastor Thad? Oh, Pastor Thad is coming. Put our hands together for the Holy Ghost. He taught us tonight, didn't he? He sure did. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Amen, amen, amen. Amen, amen. We need to say another amen, amen. amen. Praise God. You know, that was very, very good. Pastor Alex, awesome. You, you did justice by not you did justice by not going on to the other to the other um topics or the other parts of the topic tonight. You know, there um Pastor Alex often says that um the teacher is should not be the one that has um the only or the most revelation. As a matter of fact, um as the teacher is teaching, you should get more revelation. And, um, you know, well, money is kind of dear to me, and I'm not a lover of money. Um, that's not why I say that. But I do believe, I honestly believe that the one, one of the major things lacking from the kingdom of God for our efficiency and effectiveness is not the spirit of God. It's money. It's money. All right? The Bible says money answers all things. The Bible also says that money is a defense. It is a defense. So we're talking about strategies here. Money all by itself is a weapon. It's a weapon. And, you know, th tonight the Lord is showing us that we as believers need to understand that we need money as one of our weapons. Amen? And we need that weapon so that we can not, 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 just, not, not just so that we can say that we are rich or we are not poor, but that we can understand, that we can actually become 
actually people of authority. You know, when you read that scripture tonight, Pastor Alex, about that man in, in the small city, the Bible was very specific. The city was small, it was little, and the people were few. And um, uh, an army came up against him, and this man delivered them. It meant that this man did something that was awesome. It was, it was something that should have been, it should have been, they should have had songs about him. They should have, the people, they should have, they, he should be in the history books. So a hundred years after he's dead, people, children should be reading about it in the history books. But nobody read, uh, nobody remembered him, not because he was not wise, because he was extremely wise, but simply because he was poor. They are so, they, they, and when I think about that, you can just imagine the history that we are reading today. How, how little of it we truly understand because there are so many people who are not in the history books that probably did more than the people who are in the history books. But because they didn't have the resources. You see, when you have the resources, you not only have resources for yourself, but you also have the network. And God is saying to the people of God, you see, God himself had people with him of wealth when he was on earth. Yes, the son of man had no place to lay his head, but every time he needed to lay his head, there was a room somewhere for him. But what, what happens now is that the people of God, we, 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 we don't see the importance. And a lot of times, as you say, we are born into it, but we have the power to break it. You know, there was a certain, there was a time when the people of Egypt, now I, I, I really didn't have all of this, but I'm going to run this, I'm going to run real fast. But there was a time when there was a wealthy man in Egypt by the name of Joseph. But several generations after, the people were born in poverty because they were no longer in charge. When Christians are not in charge, we're going to be in poverty. But I'm going to say a little bit more than that. There were people who were born for hundreds of years into poverty. But then there came a man that was going to, that had the power to deliver him, deliver them from poverty. His name was Moses. But, and so he did his work. But later on, they got themselves bound up again. And you see, many people speak about Samson. What the Lord said, he, he was going to start to begin. See, Samson was not assigned to take them all the way out. It was to begin. So what he did was right. What's my point? What's your point, pastor? Some of us, even though we were born in bondage and slavery. When I say slavery... No, financial slavery even though we were born there even though we have the story like 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 um like 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 minister um gary when he told me his story the other day about where his past and, and with his dad and all these things even though we have these stories it doesn't mean that we weren't born with power to break it because we don't need to be born in wealth to be able to be wealthy all we need is an anointing. All we need is God. You see, God took the least, David. Because he was the least among his brethren. And put him to be the king. And God has given us an anointing tonight. You know, Pastor Alex, I'm going to close. You know, when you're, spe when you're reading that scripture about the, the ant, you know, I just realized something. And, and we waste, we're wasting our life. And I'm not saying, I'm not saying this lightly. As you, are, as you are teaching tonight about the ant and the season, what time of the year do most animals give birth? Spring. Spring. So let's start the year with spring. What season was the ant prosperous in? What time you give birth to children in spring? Let's move away from the ant. As that child grows up and becomes an adult, he goes into summer. He or she. After a while, that summer turns into an autumn. And then that, that autumn eventually turns into a winter. Summer, summer, summer. 
even during your winter time, you still have chance to gather. What am I saying? What, do you, what are you doing in your teens? What are you doing in your 20s, in your 30s, in your 40s? Come on. In your 50s, in your 60s, if you still have strength. You see, the thing is, I should not be doing certain things in my 70s. If I, because I had time in my 20s, 30s, 40s, even 50s, and maybe even my 60s. You see, the problem is, when we are young, we are not gathering. You have a chance to get free education. But you want to have debt like everybody else. You, 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 you see where I'm coming from? We have people who are born in poverty, but yet they have the mind so that people would, 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 would flock them and say, come to my school and I'll pay you to learn at my school. We ain't fly. Mm -hmm. What well, other term y'all use for cool nowadays? Because I, 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 I'm not that young anymore. It's not hip. I don't like, I don't like that, 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 I don't like that zip code. The zip code is free. The zip code is free. The zip code means that when you leave college, that you can't, that when you get paid, 100% of the money after God's portion is yours. It means that your child is going to have even more of a head start than you did. Am I making sense tonight? And all I got that from tonight was from your teaching, Pastor Alex. We are, you know what, you know? I saw a scripture there and, I, and I have, I'm going to read it to my boss. I'm going to read it to my boss. I'm literally going to read it to my boss. Because he uses it. And I see it. You read it tonight and I saw it. I go and I buy the feel of the slowed foot. I see him do it over and over and over again. He don't really go and buy things from scratch. He watch and wait for you. You're not, you, don't see the, the, you don't see the value. If you don't see the value, you're going to sell me. That's the reason why Esau didn't get the blessing. He didn't see the value of his field. What use is this to me? A whole, a whole inheritance for one bowl. Not even the pot. A bowl. I, 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 want, I, I want us to see something here. And a lot of times we throw it away. And then the counsel. The counsel. The counsel, the instruction, we as parents, when we have been through it, we, and then we don't open our mouth and speak to our children, whether they like it or not. When you, when you hold back instruction, you are actually inflicting pain and poverty to your child. I could have gotten a college education at an early age simply because... And the reason why I didn't get it, because one class I went to school in... And I messed around in that class because I didn't like the teacher. Couple of years after, one class, one subject I need to turn my college education from three years, from four years to three years. One class. And it was the same class. And the children want to come and do the same thing. The devil is a liar. The devil is a liar. Mm -mm. Not, not, not on this watch. Not on this watch. Not on this watch. I, I, I have lived the result of that. Why, why do we let our children? You have a young child coming up. Make some preparation. It doesn't mean you have to have, you, you're not going to have it all. But you're going to put things in place, steps in place. That's why I hate to see waste in the house. I hate it. I hate it. I didn't have half of this, not even quarter. A quarter, sorry. I didn't have a quarter of this growing up. Didn't. I could only dream about it. That's when I got like 50% in my dreams. Some of us know what we're talking about. 
But then you see, when we, some of us, because we don't have it, when we do see it, we get so excited that we don't become diligent anymore. But anyway, I'm not going to preach over because I'm, I'm excited tonight. I was tired, but I was very, I'm still very excited. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this word on tonight. We thank you, Lord, for this teaching. God, we understand, Lord, even from this teaching, that you are truly concerned about all of our fears. There is absolutely nothing about us that you are not concerned about. And Lord, we thank you for being concerned about our mind. We thank you for being concerned about our health. We thank you for being concerned about our spiritual well-being. We thank you for being concerned about everything else. But on tonight, we thank you for being concerned about our resources and in particular our financial resources. In the name of Jesus, Lord, we are praying tonight, Lord, that Lord, this Lord, this Lord, hallelujah, Lord, this, this, this heaviness, Lord, this weight of poverty would be lifted from our shoulders, from our minds, Lord, from our understanding tonight, Lord. And Lord, we pray, Lord, that Lord, we will walk with the authority, Lord. Oh God, there are so many men and women of God who are so wise, have so much to give to this earth and simply because of their standing, their standing in society, their voice is not heard. But on tonight, Lord, we ask you to turn it around. We turn it around in the name of Jesus. God, when, when Joseph didn't have much, his brothers didn't listen to him. He was still, according to the New Testament, he was still a youth. He was still under governance. But when he was now the governor and they came, they had to listen to his instructions. God, I pray right now that you will empower your people. Help us to use the seasons of life as you have given to us. God, your word declares that there is a time for everything. Oh God, and Lord, tonight we are asking you to give us again the time to gather. The, the time to consider and to make wise plans. So that, Lord, we can advance in the kingdom in the name of Jesus. Oh, God, I thank you, Lord, for all that you're doing. It, Lord, whatever strategy we have to use, whether it be borrowing, whether it be investing, Lord, whether it be being, being diligent, whether it, be, it is seeking instruction or using the kingdom management, we ask you, Lord, tonight to give us the grace to be able to not only know it, but to apply it in Jesus' name. And we give God praise. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. God bless you. Amen. That was a good teaching.